officially get started here. If I click record. All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is Pentecost Sunday. <laughs> it's Sunday, May the 31st, 2020. And we are here in our Zoom meeting, uh, probably the only uh, class that is still meeting, but uh, we have two more chapters and I didn't want to just like not finish this book. And so <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about chapter 11 of Richard Swinson's book, More Than Meets the Eye, Fascinating Glimpses of God's Power and Design. And this next to last chapter talks about time, space, and light. And we're especially going to focus in on light. And I wanted to read a couple uh, passages today from the Bible. We're going to open up to John 8 and read the last uh, five verses or six verses, I guess, of John 8. And then we're also going to read Psalm 39 in its entirety. So I will have those, those on the screen, but if you want to get out a Bible uh, to John 8 and Psalm 39, you can go ahead and do that. So the only remaining chapter of our book is going to be next week, Science, Scripture, and Sovereignty. And then we're going to take our traditional summer break. I was asking Laura at church, you know, as far as summer plans, uh, and they're trying to work that out in, in terms of what it'll look like. I hope there'll be at least one remote teacher who's going to teach remotely, uh, because at this point, like today, <clears throat> they're still limited on how many people face-to-face -face can be, you know, in a room. So what we typically do in the summer is, is offer several things, but that includes a large, uh, you know, large classroom with with many people gathered which i actually love because it's so diverse and it brings together people that aren't normally in sunday school and so anyway that that has been a favorite thing of mine for a while but uh i don't know yet um and uh we'll continue i guess to follow as far as the church on social media and watch emails and things like that but um tonight there is a pentecost night of worship which will be outside and so if you want to participate in that that is from 7 to 8 p.m and of course the church is open for folks who want to you know go there in person and so um they're uh continuing to have both services um, i actually emailed out the slides today uh, early, which I usually don't do, um, not because I don't want to, but because I'm usually editing them right up to the, the last minute, which I, I still did today. But <clears throat> I will go ahead and have those shared in our Facebook group and Google Classroom. Next year, we may actually, um, I think I'll probably keep the Facebook group open. But instead of Google Classroom, our church uh, website that we have, or I guess it's called the information system, which is connected to our finances. All of that got updated here in the spring. And so um, we had a little training a couple weeks ago talking about that, which among other things, it lets us email our, our Sunday school and small group members directly as leaders. And so but there is a, there is a, a, a way that we can be posting and sharing things in there. So anyway, next year, I'm, I'm planning on teaching this class next year. I'd like to. Um, I've loved it. I love this so much. I, I told Shelly yesterday, I said, can I just do this? Like, could I just teach this? Um, which I do enjoy other things that I do in my life. But it's, I love this for a lot of reasons. And I'm so thankful for you all being here and your participation. And it's just, you know, I, 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 I love Sunday school. I think the opportunity to connect to, uh, to each other um, and to, to go deeper in the word and to fellowship. I, and I, of course, I can't wait till we can meet again and gather. I mean, I love the fact that we had some potlucks and we got together at the Roberts and looked through their telescope and went to the science museum. You know, we did some stuff and, and I hope that that will continue next, next year. I think we're just going to like everything else have to kind of see how things go. And I, I think that we'll probably be having different answers for different people. So anyway, I don't know yet what Sunday school looks like next year, other than I do hope to, to teach this class again. So um, I'll open us up with a word of prayer, offer our big question, and we'll read our Bible verses. And then I've, uh, as in the past, made some screenshots on my iPad of some different quotations from Richard Swinson that kind of stood out. And uh, just a preview, today's video is actually going to be a hymn, because we're going to be talking, among other things, about God as light and man, there are hymns that just speak so powerfully to the theology that we read in the Bible and the understanding that we have of God beyond our complete understanding to, you know, totally wrap our heads around. But anyway, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get to hear a hymn uh, from England, actually. So 
and then we're a small group. So we may or may not break into table groups. We may just, you know, talk together. Uh, but before I pray, I, we have to talk uh, and say something about Minneapolis and, these, and the protests and the violence and what's happening in our world. Uh, the thought did cross my mind, like if we should do like a whole class about this. Um, we had some conversation after our Friday morning men's group about what we need to do, how we need, I mean, we need to talk about this. We need to uh, grapple with this. Um, and so, you know, the death of George Floyd, the protests, the violence, um, we need to be lifting up our nation, our leaders, and everyone who is affected by this, which really isn't just people in these cities. This is really affecting everyone in terms of if you're watching the news, if you've seen some of these videos, um, you know, it is, a, it, is, it, is a, it is a situation that goes far beyond just, you know, one episode of police violence. There's a lot of anger, and I'm sure that the COVID-19 quarantine and shelter in place and, ang and unemployment, like there's a whole lot of things that are playing into that. So as I open up with prayer, uh, this is a photograph of the Milky Way taken from Jackson, Wyoming. And so these are the Tetons. And my father actually shared this on Facebook. He's a member of a group that shares lots of Yellowstone Park photos. And dad grew up in Powell, Wyoming, which is just east, which is to the west of Yellowstone Park, right? Um, and uh, no, it's to the east because they go in the east entrance. So Cody and Powell are to the east. Anyway, uh, northwest Wyoming. And he, you know, of course, loves the area that he grew up in and has brought us back there. And that is not the kind of scene that we can get when we are just outside in the city, you know, whether it's Oklahoma City or anywhere else. Um, and I am going to be telling you a little bit more about your summer homework, because if you don't remember, it's to go out and look at the Andromeda Galaxy. But let's open up with a word of prayer first. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you give us to gather together, even though we are remote and we are in our homes and we are not together in person and in body, Lord, we are together in spirit. And we just want to give you thanks for your word, for your church, for the proclamation of your word, Lord, which continues even in this time of um, of sheltering in place and starting to open up our economy and starting to, uh, you know, have other questions and, and decisions that we make about our, our families, where we go and what we do. There's, so, there's still so much unknown, Lord, but you have been and always will be the same. And so we give you thanks and pray that today as we open up your word, that you would open up our hearts, that you would open up our minds. God, we lift up the um, people of Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, all of those in cities where protests are taking place. Really, Lord, all of the people of our nation and our world, God, we pray that you would you would send your Holy Spirit to inhabit and invade our hearts and that you would animate us, Lord, that, that you would take the anger and the fear um, and even the hatred that people feel, Lord, uh, God, that you would transform that. And we pray that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and that we would have open, open minds and open hearts for those around us that are suffering and hurting. Uh, God, that you would be with our leaders and that we would be able to make good so choices and good decisions to serve you and to, uh, to come together um, as your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so here's the big question. How does our understanding of God as light shape our thinking? Um, man, the, you know, we're talking time, space, and light today. There's all these things, but I, for whatever reason, really kind of gravitated to these verses about light. And I, I think since, you, you know, you first come to the church and you first go to, you know, any kind of uh, children's sermon or, or, or kids ministries, you're going to, you're going to sing what song? This little light of mine, you know, I'm going to let it shine. Every church service, there's candles, right? Um, the idea of the light, you know, God is the light of the world. It's, it's foundational. Um, but our understanding of light scientifically is really quite a bit 
more, you know, deeper and more advanced than it was even a few decades ago. <clears throat> and so we're going to think about some of this kind of, kind of thing. And, and I want to challenge you to think about that as we open up the scripture and, and we think about some of the science. So let's take a look first at uh, the last few verses, six verses of John chapter eight. This is subtitled in the New International Version, Dispute Over Jesus's Testimony. And so this starts in verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know from where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. Shoot, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to make my slide thing disappear here, and I'm not. There we go. I'm having a Zoom challenge. Let me read these, these last two, the last few verses. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. And so that's the, the NIV version. Um, I'm continuing to read a book called The Fourth Part of the World that is uh, about this map that was made in the early 1500s. And uh, it talks about all kinds of history of the early church. One of the things it talks about is how the Byzantine church or the, the Eastern church and the Latin church or the church in Rome, you know, had some disagreements over the Nicene Creed and the origin of um, of, of the Holy Spirit. And the idea we understand as far as the Trinity and the, and the, the unity of the Holy Spirit um, and and where it and where it comes from, and we have we have this idea here together. Remember, we don't ever see the word Trinity in Scripture, but we understand it from the totality of Scripture. And here we we see you know this idea of Jesus and the Father being one. And here it is, Pentecost Sunday, the day that you know God sent sent down the Holy Spirit to inhabit the hearts and minds of His people. And we understand that all three of those are persons of God. We don't, we're not a, a, a um, polytheistic faith, right? It's one of the things that Muslims accuse Christians of sometimes is being polytheistic. No, there is one God, but he has three persons and he is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so now we're going to turn to Psalm 39. And the main reason for this, this is one of the verses, well, also, John 8 was cited by Swenson in the book, um, but rather than just pick out the single verse, I want to just read the whole thing because we can. Um, so this is Psalm 39 from the NIV, and this is subtitle for the director of music for Jeduthun, a Psalm of David. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good, but my anguish increased, my heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. 
Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me that I may enjoy life again before I depart and am no more. This is the word of the Lord. So we're going to talk a little bit about science. We're going to talk about space. We're going to talk about uh, exploration, light, ways that these things intersect. And there was a pretty big headline that happened yesterday, right? That's the photograph of Elon Musk after the successful launch of the Dragon capsule um, aboard a SpaceX rocket. And in the bottom right corner there, you see the astronauts who even today as we meet and talk are in this capsule moving towards the International Space Station where they're gonna dock. For the last nine years, United States astronauts have had to fly on Russian made rockets. And so this is a US built rocket. And I think they said it took like, it's taking like 19 hours from launch. My daughter had watched it. We, we, I actually missed seeing the live launch. <clears throat> but she said, Dad, it, got, it only took like six minutes to get into orbit. Um, and then it takes like 19 hours for them to actually rendezvous. Um, but just amazing, right? Amazing to think about where science has taken us um, and where we're going with science and the things that we're even going to be seeing in our lifetimes. So let me talk real briefly about your homework and give you a little more information about it. And then we'll talk about some quotations from the, the, the uh, chapter this week. So last week, I challenged you this summer to find or get a pair of binoculars and then go out into the night sky on a clear night and, among other things, look at the Andromeda galaxy. And so why would West say Andromeda? Well, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we figured out that this you know, object 31 is a spiral galaxy. Um, evidently, it's not the closest. There are closer galaxies, but it's the closest spiral galaxy. There's different kinds of galaxies in terms of their shape. I think we talked about that last week a little bit. And so you can find different resources. If this is one that different members of our family have used at different times, it's a website called WikiHow. And so WikiHow has an article, How to Find the Andromeda Galaxy. And so one of the things that we generally know from just going out in the night sky in the Northern Hemisphere, by the way, because if we lived in Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, like it'd be different, right? Southern constellations. Um, we have the, the constellations of, um, of uh, the, um, oh, what is it called? The they follows the elliptic. Gosh, I'm, I've got to get my words right here. But like when you, when you think of the constellation Leo or Sagittarius or these kinds of things, um, that, that, you know, horoscopes are based on. There's all kinds of connections that we have here to things that are both non-theological and the theological. You've got constellations that move across the sky, but, um, and of course, everything appears to rotate because the earth rotates. But in the Northern Hemisphere, one of the things that generally, if, if you know any constellations, you're going to know the Big Dipper, and you're going to have talked about the North Star, because no matter what time of year it is, you can see northern constellations and the north star um, unless we would go really really far south close to the equator you know it, it's visible so if you can find the big dipper those two um, stars that are at the bottom of the big dipper are called the pointer stars here and the pointer stars are um, the ones that if you make a line with them you know it's not exact but it, it kind of goes to Polaris and this is not to scale right Polaris is actually darker than most of the stars that are here in the Big Dipper in the handle uh, this is something I remember from my 12th grade astronomy class there's actually two stars Alcor and Mizar and in ancient days that was considered to be a vision test could you see both of the stars and one of the things if you haven't already looked through just binoculars into the night sky is that it's incredible how many more stars you can see just with binoculars. You don't have to have a telescope. Um, and there's just so, so many out there. And so uh, kind of on the opposite side of Polaris from the Big Dipper is Cassiopeia. And she is the queen. Uh, it looks like a W that's kind of pushed over on her side. And it's really better in August to see uh, this constel to see um, Andromeda, but you we you can see Andromeda um, throughout the uh, the summer. And so, 
Andromeda looks kind of like a smudge. So here's Cassiopeia, and then off to the side is a smudge, and this is Pegasus. Of course, doesn't that look exactly like a, a uh, you know, a unicorn, a horse? You know, that's one of those things you like. <laughs> How did they make that into a horse? But uh, Andromeda is right here, kind of in between. And so this article, you know, has some links. But let me make it real easy for you, because this is what the article says, too you need to get an app. And the favorite app that I've used for a number of years, there's a bunch of them, is called Night Sky. It is free and you do not have to pay. Like a lot of apps, it will ask you, oh, subscribe. And there's, I mean, you can, you can get, I guess, some, you know, new updated information, but it fully works without, you know, paying anything. And this is my favorite space app. And so actually to this morning, as I was making a, a screenshot of this, you can put things that you want to see in the sky into the app and it will show it to you. And you can see there's this little arrow here. And so um, <laughs> Andromeda is not visible when I took this screenshot because the sun is up, you know, and look how close Venus is to the sun and, and planets and things like that. But you can use a smartphone app and you'll want to turn it probably to really kind of dim because one of the things that happens when you're out looking at stars is it takes a while for your eyes to adjust to the darkness and then you have this bright phone and then that kind of blows your your night vision so i'd turn it down so it's not super bright but then you can have it um, oriented so that it will you know have north south correct and as you move your phone around it will actually show you these arrows and you can put in andromeda and that is a way to be able to find it uh, even easier than i think probably it's good to learn the relative locations and these other things about constellations but you know, it's, uh, some people might say that's cheating. I would say it's using your tools that you have available for you. And so there was a, there's a Wikipedia um, quotation in the app that is about the um, Andromeda galaxy. And so this, uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but basically most galaxies are moving away from us and we talk about redshift. And so Andromeda is one of the few galaxies that has what's called blue shift. And that is because it's moving towards us. And so scientists expect this galaxy in 4 billion years to collide with our Milky Way. Uh, think about this. A likely outcome of the collision is that the galaxies will merge to form a giant elliptical galaxy. Such events are frequent among galaxies in our groups. The fate of the Earth and the solar system in the event of a collision is currently unknown. <laughs> Before the galaxies merge, there is a small chance that the solar system, talking about our solar system, could be ejected from the Milky Way. <laughs> so we might be kicked out or join M31. Okay, why am I talking about this besides the fact that it's really cool? Well, we're talking today about time. And I don't know about you, but when I hear people talk about how old scientists say these stars are, even rocks, right? Even when you look at rocks that we can find here in Oklahoma or, you know, uh, going different places to see mountains, to see, you know, the Grand Canyon. Like thinking about geologic time and the scale of time, it just blows your mind because we are here, as the scripture said, for such a short time. It's like we are a breath of wind, a, you know, just a, a breath of, of from from God that, that like we're missed, you know, we just are here and gone. However, even though we're here for such a short time, isn't it amazing and just mind blowing to consider that God enters into a relationship with, with us, knows us and gives us this opportunity to, to know him and to walk with him. So that's my introduction. Let's give uh, Dr. Swinson a chance to share a few of his quotations and then I'm going to play this little song and we'll talk a little bit as we, um, as we go through our lesson. So these are some highlights from chapter 11. Um, dimensions. We talked last week a little bit about dimensions and how, you know, we live in a, th a three spatial dimension world. Okay. We have the dimension of time, which some people will talk about four dimensions, but basically 3D, this is the world that we live in. And now mathematically, people that are, that are a lot smarter than I am and can do a lot better math than I can have developed 
these models of the universe that show we have more dimensions. There are more dimensions to the universe than we are able to perceive with our eyes and ears and nose and all of the senses that we have. We broke up into small groups last week, and one of the things that Mike Sharp mentioned was quantum entanglement. <laughs> it's this idea with quantum theory that objects that are physically separated, and it really doesn't matter how much distance, can still connect with each other. When we think about prayer, like prayer is something that is beyond our under our complete ability scientifically to explain. And so that's one of the things that Swenson is talking about here is that, you know, God is beyond the dimensions that we see, feel, touch, and know. Um, he can inhabit an infinite number of dimensions uh, or a smaller number of dimensions. Like God can do whatever he wants. And so in terms of miracles, Swinson says one of the ways that, that this informs us is like believing in miracles, right? We've heard about Thomas Jefferson and some of the founding fathers of the United States being theists, you know, and so not believing in a God that is active and, and works in our life. In fact, the Jefferson Bible has all the miracles of Jesus taken out. And, um, you know, that's not the God we believe in at First Presbyterian Church of Edmond. We believe in our God who is active in our lives, who has a relationship with us, who has done miracles and who can do miracles. And so Swinson references, you know, Jesus a appearing on the road to Emmaus and when he appeared following his resurrection and walking through locked doors. I mean, there's walking on the water. There's all these, you know, the heat, all these different healings. God is beyond dimension, okay? And so Jesus came down to earth as a man, but he was both fully man and fully human. And so he does not, you know, have to follow the same kinds of physics that we do uh, because he's beyond us in terms of dimension. In terms of light, these were some things that Swinson talked about with light saying that, you know, scientifically, some of the things that we understand, um, light uh, ha is a speed limit of the universe. That's one of the things that Einstein in his theories, which we, you know, which, which don't, don't give us everything, didn't unify all energies and all the, the forces of the universe, um, but it gave us a lot more insight. And, and as you read this stuff, you're like, how did Einstein just like think and figure this stuff out? <laughs> you know, uh, in the, in, in what, the 1905, when was, when he published one of his first works that he earned a Nobel prize for the speed of light is constant in the universe. According to Einstein, it is outside of time. It never ages. Uh, this is the anchor for relativity. Um, Einstein helped us understand that, that light has two different natures, the nature of a particle and a wave simultaneously. Light is what allows us to see, right, visually. We could not be seeing without light. When we have light, it comforts us, you know, oftentimes in the dark. We think about children, but not just children. When it's nighttime, when it's dark, we have fear. You know, what can help us, you know, keep that fear at bay? A nightlight, not being in the dark. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to be in a cave. I bet I know Mike has because he's... He's done a, bu a bunch, I think, with, with mines and mine safety and things like that. Um, <clears throat> when I went to Philmont Scout Ranch as a scout, which would have been sometime, probably like 86, uh, we, we, ha we had a chance to go into one of the mines there that, you know, has a certain amount that the mine inspector says it's safe and then it's barricaded. And so you wear these headlamps and you have your flashlights and you're walking, you know, deep into this mountain. And man, I mean, when you turn off the headlamps and lights and you are deep in the earth, it is so dark. I mean, it is the darkest, the blackest I have ever, I've ever experienced. And to imagine what it would be like to be there by yourself, for instance, and then to have your light go out, to not be able to turn on a light and just be in the dark. Think about those kids in Thailand, right? The soccer team was a year or so ago, I think, that was on that hike, and they ended up, you know, going into this mine, and then I think it rained and flooded, and they got trapped, and they were there for a long time, and they got rescued, but light is so important 
Light consumes darkness, but itself is never consumed. Isn't that just amazing? And we understand theologically, you know, with, with God being the light, that that's the truth, that God is light and that the darkness can never overcome the light. God wins. Jesus wins in the end. Light is mentioned as the first thing God created after the heavens and the earth, and that light has a divine aspect to its nature. All right. The speed of light um, actually wasn't established by Einstein. It was by Maxwell uh, a number of years earlier. It was 186,000 miles per second. But Einstein went further, and yeah, according to his theories, regardless of your frame of reference, the speed of light is constant. And this is a real bummer when kids uh, like me, you know, learn this in school because we want warp you know, capability. We want to be able to move faster than the speed of light. Because if we can't, man, we're never going to get to the Andromeda galaxy in our lifetime, right? Um, and so anyway, this um, idea of light being a constant uh, and that, that we can use the measurement of light as a way to measure distances. And that's why we talk about light years. That's the distance that light can travel in a year because the speed of light is constant throughout the entire universe. So photons, um, how, how are we going to have light? How are we going to have energy? Um, God created the sun. It's 93 million miles away from earth. Uh, Swinson quotes this that says, we intercept only one billionth of the photons that are emitted from the sun, yet that is precisely the right amount of, of light and heat and energy that we need on the earth to have life and to have the incredible diversity of life that we have on our planet. Um, this is kind of interesting, and I don't know that I had made this connection or, or understood this before, and I'm not going to say I understand it completely, but um, when you, I've heard this before, that when you get closer and closer to the speed of light, time changes, and we'll talk about the space-time continuum. Um, according to the theories of Einstein, time actually stops at the speed of light. So photons don't age. So light that is coming out from the sun or from any other light source uh, is not two seconds, you know, 90 seconds old or four days old. Light does not get old, explains quantum physicist Brian Greene. There is no passage of time at light speed. I think that's really cool. And I don't think that's a, an idea I had really ever heard before. And so at the speed of light, which is the highest speed we know of in our universe today, time ceases to flow altogether. The time of all events becomes compressed into the present and unending now. The laws of relativity have changed timeless existence from a theological claim to a physical reality. And he goes into, you know, some of this theology about, about God and God being outside of time. Um, this is amazing to me. God sees us without light. Okay, if you think about our eyes, we have to have photons hitting a surface of something and then bouncing back and going through our retina and, and going to the, you know, the back of our eye and then our brain interprets that. That's how we see. But think about how God is able to see everything and he can see it simultaneously and he can hear all prayers simultaneously because God is beyond time. You know, he's, he's able to be beyond the dimensions that we live in. Okay, so here's where I got the reference for the song we're going to listen to in a second, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. I know you know this song. And <clears throat> I think this points to how Scripture and through his word, God gives us glimpses of this vast universe and this impossible to fully understand world that he's created for us, but he allows us to glimpse it, and he allows us even to experience it through the great hymns of the church, among, you know, other things. And of course, this hymn is informed by scripture. Um, we read about God being light throughout scripture, and God said, let there be light, and there was light the last chapters of the of the New Testament. In fact, this is, I know this is in the um, movie, the, the Titanic, when the guys are like playing the, you know, playing the, uh, 
cello and the, the violin on the on the deck you know they as the as the boat sinks there will be no more night they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the lord god will give them light um lots and lots of references to god being light um we read the the scripture t- today from john 8 where jesus proclaims i am the light of the world and um the essence of god god calls himself light and Swinson um, observes, very seldom does God allow a noun to be substituted for his name. We do find it written that God is love and that God is spirit, but such occurrences are rare. In 1 John, however, we read, God is light. So with that, uh, this was the concluding paragraphs of the chapter. What will it be like to someday have God, the great physician, take over? He will redefine everything, change the laws of science, and rid his realm of <clears throat> decay, pain, and aging. He will introduce new dimensions that will grant us mobility and communications possibilities previously unimagined. And in our midst will be a light so brilliant that it would blind us with fear had it not first swallowed us with love. All right, so here is the two minute video and then we'll have some time to respond and think a little bit about our big question. Um, I Googled on YouTube, immortal, invisible, God only wise. And I found, well, this was one of the videos I found that had the most views. So this has about a quarter of a million views. And this is eight years old from 2012. I, as I watch it, and as you watch it, I didn't, I wonder if the people who were singing it this time in the congregation realized they would be on YouTube maybe forever. <laughs> um, because this isn't just like the, the a choir at the front. This is like the congregation. But I think this is from Halifax, uh, England. And so as we watch this video, um, I want you to think about this metaphor, this idea of God as light, and, and think about how that, how that affects and changes your thinking. Here we go. Oh, are you serious? Watch this on YouTube. Huh. All right, let's try this a different way. We will click the link. I was thinking I could see it on my slideshow, but hopefully we're going to get this without a advertisement. Yay. All right. So um, our question is, how does our understanding of God as light shape our thinking? Um, So I'm going to stop talking, stop sharing my screen and uh, open that up for sharing.
What do you all think? <laughs> well, I was curious about that last line on the hymn where it said, the splendor, like the light hideth God. Is that what it said? Light hideth thee? Yeah, that is. I don't know. I'm not sure what that, I'm not sure what the scriptural basis of that is. I, I like the fact that it had the it had the words there because attending to the words as as they're singing, you know. But yeah, I, don't I don't know how light would hide him. It seems like it would glorify him, and yeah, I I don't know. Light reveals. <laughs> yeah. What other thoughts went through your head? Not only as we were looking at that video, but just as we were reading these other scriptures and thinking about God as light. Mm -hmm. To me, it uh, seemed like, Oops, sorry. No, go ahead, Dwight. It, to me, it seemed like that if God is light, then he reveals all. And, you know, we don't have anything to hide because mm -hmm. he will see it. Yeah, we can't hide, right? And I think that, part of what we're, we're doing with science, what's happening with science, is we are starting to see more. You know, we're seeing more of the galactic, we're seeing more of the, the biological, the DNA. Um, we are seeing more of, of God's universe. What else? Denise, did, were you? Yeah, I was gonna say when um, Moses was up in the mountains and God passed by and he just saw like the that part but wasn't he wasn't God hidden by the light then so maybe that's you know kind of a reference to that God being hidden by the, we can't see God anyway and, that's just and, what I thought and we're unable to fully behold God in all his glory I mean that's something we get from the burning bush story as well as some other places but like if we think that we can just fully, you know, see God and, and be like right there with him in a full, full on everything. I mean, Moses, I think, had to look at God through a cleft in the rock, right, to glimpse him. Yeah, yeah. Um, God's enormity and his reality is beyond our human capacity to fully see and comprehend. What else? It's like whenever you turn on a light in a room, the light fills the room. It's the same thing with God. He, when he's there, he's, I mean, he's there filling the room at all times. Where, where Chase, are. Chasing all the shadows away, you know. I mean, some of the most powerful services I've been at are the candlelight services, right? And we can all probably think about, especially a Christmas Eve service, you know, the symbolism of the light, this one light. You know, this one candle, which symbolizes Jesus at the beginning uh, of, the, of, the, of that part of the service, from that light, you know, comes light that fills the entire room. Uh, it's a really powerful symbolism. And light is warm, uh, always. I can't think of a time when light is not warm. And, you know, that's kind of the... That's that's uh, related to to love. Love makes you feel warm, also. And it's for survival. You know, I was a survival in, instructor at the Air Force Academy one summer as a cadet, and you know, I did did stuff with sur wilderness survival and scouts. What is one of the first things you learn to do in a survival situation? You've got to get warm. You got to stay dry. You got to find shelter. But fire and being able to create a fire, which can be a signal but it is mainly to keep you alive and keep you warm. I mean, it is basic, you know, and if we talk about the hierarchy of needs, the number one need we have is to be safe. If we don't feel safe, our brain is going to be doing things that try to get us in a position of safety. And so light, which brings warmth, as David said, is absolutely a foundation to life. Well, and it also chases away, you know, I, I think about right now, our daughter, the exterminator just came and sprayed with all the 
you know, bugs that come out at night. I've had some roaches the in the kitchen, full the, disclosure. The kitchen, without turning on the light or sending the dog in first because she's definitely afraid of the, the bugs that might come out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, but turning on the light or, you know, having the light not only for warmth, but also to chase away danger, you know, as well. Light drives out the darkness. It drives away the, the perceived dangers. I have, uh, I can't prove this, certainly, but uh, I know I experienced this and I assume that most folks did, the stories I've heard they did, and that's when I came to Jesus. It was a very dark moment in my life. And uh, as soon as I welcomed him into my heart, uh, the light was turned on. And I've heard that story over and over and over again. So, Absolutely. And it's one of those things that the Bible doesn't say God is like light. Jesus is like light. He is the light. Anything else? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording at that point then. And if I can figure out where to do that.